Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Tom Kite. Uh, and I'll be talking to you about a few things related to Oracle and some implementation details. I'm going to talk about three different topics. The first one's going to be to do with trigger trickery. Now, with triggers in the database, there's a couple of questions you need to ask yourself. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of database triggers. They're sort of these magic things that happen in the background. But a couple of interesting questions around triggers that we're going to take a look at are things like, when do your triggers actually fire? And what do those triggers actually see? Uh, you might be surprised by the answer to that. Uh, how many times can a row level trigger fire? If you have a one row table, and you have a before update for each row uh, trigger, and you update that one row, how many times might that row level trigger fire? You'll be surprised by the answer to that as well. Uh, and then the last two questions, will your trigger actually fire? Uh, are triggers guaranteed to execute? Uh, does your trigger prevent things from happening as you think they should? And we'll take a look at the answer to those questions as well. So first, when do your triggers actually fire and what do they actually see? Well, we have four basic types of triggers. There, there's a fifth type in 11G called a compound trigger, but that really just encapsulates uh, the four basic trigger types we have. There's a before trigger. It fires before your statement ever even executes. And that, that before trigger sees nothing. It's just an alert saying, hey, this update statement is going to take place. There's a before for each row trigger that sees what the row might look like and what that row might become. And I threw the words might in there because in the before for each row trigger, what the trigger is seeing in the colon new and colon old records are actually read consistent images of the row, meaning it's it's the version of the row that was committed in the database when that modification statement started. Someone may have come along while your update statement was executing and updated and committed the row that you're going to now be updating. Your before for each row trigger will not see their changes, even if it's already committed, because it's using a consistent read. And we'll see what the, the impact, the effect of that is in a minute. Now, then there's the after trigger. And it sees the row as it was before and after the row update. It will be the current version of that record. Okay? And it is what the record will become if that modification statement is actually successful. Okay? It may or may not persist in the database because the statement could roll back, the transaction could roll back. And then we have the after trigger, and the after trigger sees nothing again. It's just sort of an alert. Uh, your update statement has completed. So getting to the question of how many times can a trigger fire, you might be surprised to know that the before statement trigger might fire twice. The before for each row trigger could fire twice per row. The after for each row trigger can fire twice per row except for the last row to be updated. And we'll see why that is in a second. And then your after trigger, that's the only one that is more or less guaranteed to only fire once. And we can actually observe this. I'm going to create a really small table and put three records into it. One, two, three. On disk, those records are actually stored in that order. You cannot be assured that records are stored in the order of insertion. But Rest assured, for this particular example, for this table, if we did a full scan, they would come out in the order of 1, 2, 3. And that's the order they're actually stored on disk. Now, we're going to put a before trigger on this, before update. And this is going to be uh, a before update trigger. So any update statement will fire this. And it's just going to print out, I am firing. Then we're going to put a row trigger on here, before update for each row. And we're just going to print out, this is the old record, and this is the new record. So we can see what the record was and what the record will become. We're also going to put an after update trigger, basically printing out the same information. This is what the row was. This is what the row is going to become. And then we're going to have an after update trigger so that we can just see on the after update trigger firing, and we can see that the statement completed. So in one session, we're going to do an update. We're going to update that third record in the table. So this is going to do a full scan because there's no indexes on this table. And it would have read record one, 
found that it didn't match the predicate. Record two didn't match the predicate. And then record three. Now, before it did the full scan for the update, it would have printed out, I am the before trigger firing. And then when it hit row three, we can see that it changed three comma zero to three comma 100. That's what we were expecting. The after update, same thing. And then the after trigger firing. This is what everybody expects to have happen. Now, without committing, we're going to go into another session. And we're going to update that same table and set y equal to 42. Now, this statement will more or less immediately block, right? Because that third record in there is exclusively locked by the first session. Now, what you can't see yet, because DBMS output, output only displays after the statement's completed, is the fact that the before trigger has fired. Because before the update even starts, the before trigger would be executed. You would also notice, if we could see the DBMS output right now, that some of our row triggers have fired. Because this update statement will do a full scan of the table again, and it will read record one using a consistent read, and it will see that that record matches the predicate, the where clause. We don't have a where clause. We're updating every record. So it would actually fire the before update trigger for row one. Then it would actually make the update, and it would fire the after for each row trigger for row one. And so we would have seen the before trigger, the before for each row, the after for each row trigger fire. Then we go into row two. And that row matches our predicates. So the before trigger, the before for each row trigger would fire. We'd actually do the update. And then the after for each row trigger would fire. Then we get to row three. Now remember, row three is locked. But in Oracle, reads don't block writes, writes don't block reads. So we actually get a read consistent image of, of row three. And we call your before trigger, the before for each row trigger. And that trigger would actually execute. And it would get a reconsistent version of the record, not what the other session had modified it to yet. And what that reconsistent record would become if the update statement succeeds. After that trigger fires, we go to actually do the update. This is where we get blocked. The other session has a lock on that row. We get stuck. That's exactly where this session is right now. So we'll go back to the first session and type commit in. And as soon as we do that, the other session becomes unblocked. But what it discovers when it becomes unblocked is that it had lied to us. If you look at this output, we can see that the before trigger fired. And we can see that we updated row 1, then we updated row 2. And then where I have the how did that happen, we can see that we were told we were updating row 3, 3 comma 0 to 3 comma 42. But we weren't updating 3 comma 0. 3 comma 0 is what I originally inserted into the table. The other session had updated it to 3 comma 100. But we couldn't see that change yet. We were blocked on that change. We were waiting for that change to complete. Now, when that change completed, we read the current version of that row, because that's what we really have to update. And we noticed that the current version of the row, 3 comma 100, was different than the read consistent image we had received before, 3 comma 0. We realized at that point in time that we had lied to you. And so what we do is we roll back that transaction. We roll back that, that statement, rather, not the entire transaction. We just roll back your update, and we restart it. And you can see us restarting here. The before trigger fired again then row 1, then row 2, then row 3 with the 3 comma 100, and then the after trigger fired. Now, why do you care about this behavior? What does this mean? In short, it means do not do anything non-transactional on a trigger. What are non-transactional things? Most of the UTL packages. If you had to call the util file in there and you wrote a line to a file in the trigger, that doesn't roll back when the statement rolls back. It doesn't roll back when the transaction rolls back. If you made a web service call from a trigger, it doesn't roll back. And notice what would have happened on row three if we had been firing a web service. We would have fired it once, perhaps, for 3 comma 0 being turned into 3 comma 42. But that's an update that never actually happened. Right? We, we sort of lied at that point. And when we lie to you, we have to roll back. Sending email with you to SMTP, that doesn't roll back. So anything that doesn't roll back would be a bad idea to put 
in a trigger. Even just setting global variables in a trigger can be a risky proposition because if you're counting rows that are being updated or whatnot, uh, your counter doesn't roll back. We don't subtract three from it because we roll back your update statement and then let you count those three records again. We would have double counted those particular updates. Then the last part with the uh, trigger is, will your trigger actually fire? You have a trigger in place, it's enabled, it's valid, and you do some operation that puts data in the table. Is your insert trigger guaranteed to fire? And the, the answer to that is no, not always. And the other question is, if I put a trigger on the table, does it change the way the database works? Do certain statements work differently? And the answer to that is also yes. So here I'm going to create a, a table and put a small trigger on it. And this trigger is just going to change colon new dot y into negative new dot x. So anytime you insert into this table, no matter what value you supply for y, it's going to be set to negative x when we insert it. We'll go ahead and we'll test this out. We'll insert the values 100, 200. And sure enough, when we select star from the table, we can see our, our trigger obviously fired because it's 100, negative 100. So what we'll do next is we'll load some data into the table. So I'll just use SQL loader. We're going to load the row 100, uh, comma 42. And so I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll load that. We get the one record loaded. And when we look at the, uh, the table data, it's not 100, negative 100 as it should be. It's 100. 42. And that was because we did what's known as a direct path load. I did a large bulk load. Bulk loads silently, invisibly, magically bypass triggers. They, they just don't fire. And nobody tells you that they didn't fire. I mean, the documentation tells you that they don't fire, but you don't see anything visible in the log file or on screen. You just sort of have to know. If you got a trigger, it's not going to fire in the direct path load. So you decide to try to do the direct path load a different way, using SQL. We'll truncate that table. And then I'll use an insert with the append hint. The append hint is a method for doing a direct path load from SQL. So we'll do an insert append, select 100, 200 from dual. And now I look at the data, and I can see that the trigger must have fired because it's set to 100, negative 100. So apparently, if I do a direct path load in SQL, it does fire the triggers. That's not really what happened. The very fact that I was able to run that select statement successfully indicates that we did not do a direct path load. For example, if I drop that trigger, truncate the table, and I re-execute that same exact insert append statement, this is what I would expect to see if, in fact, we had done a direct path load. The addition of a trigger on a table makes it so that you can't do direct path loads in SQL anymore. Changes the behavior of certain SQL statements. The next one we'd like to take a look at are some things with to do with nulls and indexes and cardinality. Okay. I have a saying that if we get the wrong estimated cardinality, we're probably going to get the wrong query plan. So for example, if I told you that table T has a billion records in it, and your where clause is going to find one of those records, you would probably want to use an index if you're going to get one out of a billion. But what if at runtime when you ran your query, instead of getting one row, you found that you got 900 million rows out from that where clause? If we incorrectly estimated cardinality, we might pick an index when we should have full scanned, or we pick a full scan when we should have used an index. So getting the right cardinality is crucial. I'd like to take a look at nulls and the impact that nulls may have on cardinality estimates first. I'm going to create a table where approximately 50% of the rows have a column called end date, and end date has a null value inside of it. The other 50% of the rows will have an end date value. It will be not null. So about half the data has this end date null, and the other half is not null. If we start to take a look at this data, I'm going to index it because we want to be able to query by this end date. If we start to take a look at this data, I can see that there's a lot of records in the month of September 2010. This is just a quirk of, of my data set. It's skewed information. That happens to be the day, the month that I installed my database. So most of my timestamps in the database are actually in that particular month. So I'm going to go ahead and gather statistics. And we'll take a little bit closer look at the data now. We'll count how many records are in the table. There's 
about 72,000. There's 703 distinct values for end date. There are 36,850 non-null values, about half the rows in the table. And if we look at the, the data for this, the minimum end date was October 2002, and the maximum end date was September 2011. So imagine, if you will, the histogram that's been generated on this table. If you think about it, it's got two endpoints, October 2002, September 2011. And it's a pretty low graph, except for over the month of September 2010, there's that real big bump of data where there's some 32,000 records. Okay, so most of the data is actually in the month of September 2011. Now, when we ask the database to come up with estimated cardinalities, so I'll go in here and I'll, I'll run a query, give me all the data for September 2010, right now, the database comes up with a really dead-on accurate estimation of the rows, 36,000. And it knows that's half the data. Let's use a full scan. An index would be silly for this. So we're going to come back, and we're going to replace that null with one of these fake values. So the developers are sort of afraid of nulls, so they're going to update and set the end date equal to some date way out in the future, January 1st, 9999. Okay? This is a very common practice. It's a practice I'm not a big fan of, and we'll see why in a second. Gather statistics on this table. Now imagine what the histogram, okay, and this gather table stats command is actually generating histograms. You can verify that in your data dictionary if you want to run through this example yourself. But imagine what the histogram looks like now. It starts in October 2002, and it stays really flat to the x-axis for a while. It's got that bump in September of 2010, and then it goes flat again, and it stays flat for a really long time, going all the way out to January of 99.99. We've put this really artificially high endpoint in the database. This is going to have a profound impact on our ability to estimate statistics. The histogram we have is on 710 distinct values now. We only get a perfect histogram, a frequency-based histogram, if you have less than 255 distinct values. So since we have 710, we know that we have what's known as a height-balanced yeah, height histogram, meaning we have a, an imperfect, fuzzy picture of the data. And in fact, by having this, this outlier way far out, combined with the bump in September 2010, this is going to have a drastic impact on our ability to estimate cardinalities. We're going to run that same query. Give me everything in September 2010. Look at that estimated cardinality now. It's 175. And the optimizer is thinking it's going to get 175 rows out of 72,000. It says index, obviously. But that's the wrong plan, because we're getting almost half of the rows out of this table with this query the presence of that fake value throws off the optimizer. Wrong cardinality, you're going to get the wrong plan. Another thing with nulls and indexes, there's a myth that indexes and nulls are like matter and antimatter. They, they don't mix. If you have a null in a column, you can never use an index to retrieve data from that table via that column if you're looking for null entries. In short, there's a myth that where column is null, cannot use an index in order to retrieve data. So let's take a look at this. We'll, we'll create a table where about 2% of the records have a null value in a column named O-type. The other 90% have some value in it. We'll go ahead and do a count and verify. We know this table has about 72,000 records in it. It's a copy of all objects. About 1,400 of them are null. So we'll go ahead and we'll gather statistics. We'll create an index on O type, that's the nullable column, comma, owner. It's a concatenated index. Now, that owner column happens to be not null in the database. When I go and I run a query, select star from T where O type is null, the optimizer, since it gets the right estimated cardinality, knows all about the nulls in there, has that information, knows there's 1445 of them out of 72,000, it uses that index. Notice it's using an index range scan, even though the predicate clearly is O-type is null. It's right there in, in the plan itself. Okay? 
And that's because when you have an attribute in an index that is known to be not null, owners in that index, the database knows that every row in the table will appear in that index. If, on the other hand, I had an index just on O type, that column that allows nulls, the database would not know that every row in the table also appears in the index. In Oracle, in a B tree index, if you have an entirely null index key, we don't place an entry in the B tree index for that. Okay? So there are some nuances with nulls and in indexing, but as long as there's at least one not null attribute, it will be in the index. Now, what if you didn't want to have owner in that index? What if you just wanted an index on O type? You know, for space requirements, for size requirements, and whatnot. So you wanted the index just to be on that one column, but still be able to use it. All we have to do is put something in that index that the database knows is not null. The number zero, very small, tiny, is known to be not null. So if I create an index on O type, comma, the number zero, the expression zero, I can still use that index in an index range scan to find those nulls. So nulls are easily retrievable from a table using an index. The truth about this all is that entirely null key entries are not made in B-tree indexes in Oracle. So if I just had the index on O-type, it couldn't be used to find the null values in the table. If I have an index on O-type, comma, anything else that is known to be not null, the database can and will quite naturally use that index. This only applies to B-tree indexes, by the way. There's B-tree cluster indexes, there are bitmap indexes, there are other types of indexes. Those indexes all index nulls quite naturally. So what I mean by that is if I create a bitmap index on a nullable column, if I was to create a bitmap index on O-type, the database would quite naturally and normally use that bitmap index just on O-type because in a bitmap indexes, nulls are indexed. Now the last of the three sections here are is implicit conversions are evil. SQL and PL SQL are way too user friendly. Unlike the language C, which I, I programmed in for many, many years. In C, if I want to assign something of one data type to something of another data type, I have to explicitly convert that. I have to go through all kinds of work to make that movement. In SQL and PL SQL, you can assign a string to a date, to a number, to a raw, to a string, and so on. And many things can happen to it along the way. Okay? So for example, here's a very small stored procedure. It takes a date as an input. So way up on line number one, p underscore date, end date. That's a seven byte binary format. It's not a string, it's not characters, it's a binary date. Now for whatever reason, the developer decides to use uh, dynamic SQL, and they're using string concatenation. So they're putting the date into the query. And I see this all the time. Let's just take the date, concatenate in a string, and execute it. There's a double implicit conversion taking place there. We're zeroing in on that line of code, that where created equals concatenate with the date is semantically equivalent to where created equals to date of the to care of the date field. The to care comes from the fact that we're concatenating a date to a string. So there's an implicit conversion there. We can't concatenate a date to a string. We can only concatenate strings to strings. So we implicitly convert the date into a string using whatever the default NLS date format is. Then later, at runtime, we're comparing created equals some string. Well, create is a date. We can't really compare a date to a string. We have to convert the string back into a date using the NLS date format. Okay. There's a logic bomb here right now. The logic bomb is, what if I was looking for something that was created on January 1st, 2012 at 11.30 in the morning? Well. The 11.30, by default, is going to be stripped off here. This actually changes the data. By default, the analyst date format is dd-mon-rr. So by default, that's going to wipe out the time component. Okay. Furthermore, the default date format, this is the second logic bomb, uses rr, a two-character year. 
we should have learned our lesson a dozen years ago at the year 2000 and just sworn off using two character years, but that's the default NLS date format. If I was searching for something that was created during the War of 1812, I'm not going to be able to find it because it's going to take 1812 in my date, turn it simply into 12, and when we go to two date that later, using RR, it's going to turn it into 2012. You know, in 38 years, it will turn it into 2112. The RR date format uses a 100-year sliding window based around the turn of the century. So there's two, at least two logic bombs in there. But there's also a worse one. There's a SQL injection bug in here. I run that store procedure and I pass it to state. This is what the developer was expecting to have generate. Select star from table where created equals for October 11th. Okay? And they test it out and it works great. So they go production with this, but when they run this code, somebody comes along and says, hey, I'm just going to set my NLS date format. Every user who has create session has the ability to change their NLS date format. Even though it's an alter session command, it does not require the alter session privilege. So anybody could do this. And this end user happens to be a, a smart one. They know that they can put character string literals in the NLS date format. So when they run this code, it turns into select star from all users where created equals the date or A equals A. All of a sudden I have access to the entire table. We might say, yeah, that, that's okay. Uh, they're allowed to see that table anyway. So this isn't a security risk at all. It's not a problem. Well, what if I come along and I, I want to do something else, like query one of your other tables. This stored procedure gives me, at a minimum, read access to everything the owner of this procedure has read access to. All I'm going to need to do is inject a union in there. Now, I don't know what your tables are yet, so I'm going to try and figure out what they are. And what I'll do is I'll union select T name, comma, zero, comma, null from tab. Look what the query now becomes. Select star from all users where created equals null, basically. So that's not going to find any rows there. Union select T name from tab. I'm going to get a list of all your tables. Then I'll come back and I'll query call. I'll get a list of all your columns in, in a particular table. Then I can start querying that information as well. So that gives me read access at least. I can also use this stored procedure. I'm not going to go into how to right now. I can use this stored procedure if I have create session and create procedure in your database to take over your account. So if I had create procedure and I had access to this store procedure you own, I can use this store procedure to drop any of your tables, create a new table for you, rename something, update any information, even log in as your username and password. Okay? And it's, it's really not that difficult to do. String concatenation, implicit conversions, logic bugs, also SQL injection issues. And what about performance? There's the overhead of repeated conversions, access path reductions, and partition elimination eliminated. When I'm running these next examples, I want to point out that I've set PL SQL warnings to enable colon all. I recommend everybody out there does this as they're compiling all of their PL SQL code into the future. We'll go ahead and we'll create a procedure P it's going to put a date into a varchar, because a lot of people just tend to do this. And it's going to do a select against a big table a couple of times, where create it, which is a date, equals L underscore date, which is a string. Now, every time we execute that predicate, we're going to be performing functions against that column, uh, against that bind variable, L underscore date. Now notice the procedure created with compilation warnings. We'll take a look at what those are in a second. And when we execute this, it took 132 units of CPU time. The warning we got was the PL SQL compiler actually telling us that there was an implicit conversion taking place in our SQL. On line 10, and conversion away from the column type may result in suboptimal query plan. Now in this case, it didn't affect the query plan. It was a full scan but it did negatively impact our performance. Because if I recreate that procedure and I use the right data type, compare a date to a date, my CPU time drops down to 94 units of CPU. That's 30% less CPU just because we're not doing this repeated conversion in this particular case. 
Here's another one where the implicit conversion is evil. I have a, a column, it's a primary key, but we use the data type varchar, even though we only put numbers into it. The end users know it's always numbers. The developers know it's always numbers. So it makes sense that somebody's going to bind a number against that column. And so we're going to do select star from the table where x equals L underscore key. Now that's where varchar equals number. When we compare a string to a number, we have to convert the, the data types. We, we can't compare strings to numbers. We can only compare strings to strings and numbers to numbers. So one of those is going to be implicitly converted. Now, that procedure created with compilation warnings. That warning was, hey, on line six, you've got a conversion again. There's an implicit conversion there, and that, that's bad. And when we run this procedure, we can see that our select star from table where x equals colon v1, where primary key equals bind variable, used a full scan. You would expect a primary key to use an index unique scan. Everybody would. But in this case, we can't. And you can see why at the bottom of this slide, there was an implicit function where two number of x, where two number of the primary key equals bind variable. When we compare a string to a number, we have to convert the string into a number. There was a function applied to that column. If we use the right data type, compare a string to a string, all of a sudden we get the index unique scan we were looking for. Now let's take a look at another one with uh, partitioning. I create a table and I use a date to partition my tables. But I wouldn't use timestamps. I mean, timestamps would be a silly sort of thing in this particular example. I just need the day, the month, and the year. So we partition by a date. But now I have an application, perhaps a Java application, where the developers are using timestamps. And so what they do is they bind a timestamp to compare it to my date column. So we're doing a select count star into a variable from table where date equals timestamp. We get that compilation warning again. We can see that there was an implicit conversion. And when we run that query, we can see something disturbing. We have a query where partition key equals value. If I have where partition key equals value, we should be doing partition elimination, right? We're only going to hit one partition. But notice what the p start and p stop values are here. We started at partition one, we stop at partition two. It full scanned every partition. Why? Looking further down on the slide, we can see there was a function applied to our date column. Our date column is our partition key. As soon as we applied a function to it, we cannot do partition elimination anymore. So comparing a date to a timestamp, implicit conversion, I lost partition elimination. If I fix the code, if I bind a date to be compared to a date, or if I would have simply taken my timestamp and cast it as a date in the SQL statement, right? if I wanted to bind a timestamp for whatever reason, explicitly cast it to the correct data type, when I run this, I get partition elimination all of a sudden. I, I don't know what partition I'm going to hit, but the fact that I see key, key there tells me that I'm getting partition elimination. And then taking a further look at this PL SQL warnings, instead of setting it to enable all, which just enables warnings, you can set it to error all, which says any warnings will be treated as a compilation error. So if I tried to do that implicit conversion with the timestamp, the procedure would actually compile with compilation errors. I would not be able to run that procedure until they were all corrected. You're not going to be able to do that right away. If you, if you turn on errors all, none of your code's going to compile. Right? That's just a, a fact of life. I would suggest that for the next two or three years, everybody runs with enable all. They start removing all of those warnings from the code with the goal of, in a few years, running with error all so that any code that has a warning will no longer compile. And you can correct most of these issues, these, these bugs you're going to have, before the code ever goes production. These implicit conversions cause lots and lots of bugs. You know, look at that date, one, two, three. What date is that? Without an explicit conversion, without an explicit date mask to convert it from a string to a date or from a date to a string, you don't know what you're getting. Never rely on the default. Okay? So now, we're getting ready for the Q&A section of today. OK, so this question is from Wendy Hogeman. Thank you, Wendy. And uh, she's asking, have you ever seen large volume ETL processing
handled by grappling an entire partition, say partition for one day, a 24 hour period, versus row by row for X count with bulk inserts? Yes, I have. In fact, um, if you'd like to see an interesting example of this, I can suggest that you can go to youtube.com and if you search for the last name of Holdsworth, H-O-L-D-S-W-O-R-T-H, -O -O -H, just Holdsworth, and real world, you actually see an example where we're faced with the problem of, of loading a terabyte of raw input information. And we talk about how it would happen if you did it slow by slow, row by row. And we talk about what happens when we actually do it in bulk using mass operations, using things like create table with select instead of updates and, and so on, using DDL instead of DML to process this data. We were able to, to load and start querying information within the span of about 10, 15 minutes. We're talking a terabyte of raw input information. Just do some math on these things. Let's say you have a really fast ETL routine. It takes one millisecond, one one thousandth of a second, and that includes the time it takes to get any data from the database, process the data, and put it back. Okay, so that's, that's pretty unreasonably fast. You're not actually going to have this. But let's say you do one millisecond, and you have five million, five million rows, which is tiny. I mean, five million rows is nothing in today's volume but you have five million rows to process. If you did five million rows at one millisecond, that is almost an hour and a half of processing right there. But face it, you don't have five million rows anymore. You have 50 million rows. You have 500 million rows. You know, the math just defeats the ability to use slow-by-slow -slow processing. Would you like to load and validate five million rows one at a time? Would you like to load and validate 5 million rows, period, all at once? One of them is going to be incredibly efficient doing it once versus doing something slow by slow, row by row, over and over again. The database is really optimized for large bulk operations done in a single SQL statement. Uh, I'm getting ready to go to OD Tug uh, over the weekend, and as one of my talks, I compare slow by slow processing with doing the same thing in bulk processing, so bulk fetch, bulk insert back into the database, bulk update, versus doing the same work in a single SQL statement. And just in my little tiny example, the slow by slow approach is twice as long as the bulk processing approach is 10 times longer than doing it in a single SQL statement. So you can get some real efficiencies by bulking things up, doing them in large scale, doing as many, as few, really big SQL statements as possible, rather than millions or billions of tiny ones. OK, James, on to the next one. Thanks, Tom. OK, so this, this question, it might be a little bit difficult for me to explain, but I shall try my best. This is uh, from Rahul. Patagonta, thank you, Rahul, for your question. Uh, he's asking, what does this warning, why does this warning occur? And the warning is error PLW-07204, conversion away from column, column type may result in suboptimal query plan. And he's got a, a line and text where trunk B dot file date equals trunk sys date. I'd have to understand what the uh, what the data type of the underscore file type was. Uh, so yeah, it, we would actually need more information in order to do that. And bear in mind that you will get, with warnings, occasional false positives. Um, so in short, I'd have to actually see the snippet of code, the little reproducible test case, in order to a, try to explain why it happened, and then B, find a, a viable, useful, alternative way of expressing the code that does not cause that, that warning to be triggered. Uh, but you will occasionally get false positives. They, they've erred on the side of caution and said, we're going to point you to bits of code, 
it's a warning, you have to look at it critically and see if it applies. Uh, just like with lint with C, it would generate uh, some false positives every now and then. You go look at the code, and it's doing exactly what you intended it to do. So it's, in fact, a safe operation, even though they flagged it. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and as Tom mentioned, all of these qu any questions that you do enter into the questions panel, we will have a copy of, and we'll be, be able to answer them on Ask Tom uh, or All Things Oracle afterwards. Okay, so the next question is from Walter Stefanoff. Thank you, Walter. And uh, Walter's asking, in light of triggers trickery, how ineffective is CDC? In light of triggers trickery, how ineffective is CDC change data capture. Um, change data capture is perhaps as far down on my list of ways to do replication as humanly possible. Um, it, it does have certain overheads associated with it. However, any triggers that it's utilizing uh, will, in general, in many cases, be internalized. Uh, with our, all of our replication, advanced replication, materialized views, uh, replication, anything except for streams or golden gate, actually, we're using internal triggers. And those triggers, in general, are, are written in C and are fairly efficient. And they do just one thing. right? They do have, they do suffer from the same sort of restart and rollback, you know, considerations. But they don't ever do anything non-transactional in there, and so on. Triggers do have an inherent overhead, even without any of the things I was talking in trigger trickery. If you just put a trigger on a table that just has begin, null, end, you're going to find you take a performance hit for that. There's the overhead of invoking that trigger over and over and over again. So in general, if they can be avoided. Triggers are a good thing to avoid. However, if you're using a database feature like replication, sometimes they're unavoidable. In order to get that feature, you're going to have to have some overhead of, of triggers in the background. That's why looking at log-based replication, stream, golden gate, for example, where the processing can be done outside the database without any impact on the existing database's performance, uh, is more appealing to me. Thanks, Tom. So the next question is from Tanmoy Chowdhury. Thank you, Tanmoy. Uh, uh, Tanmoy is re referring to having a null value in a data column, and he would like uh, some ad advice or maybe just some comments from yourself about why certain Oracle products like the eBusiness, HR, MS, Advocates having dates like 31 December 4, 7, 1, 2 in dates column. Sure. It's because when you join Oracle Corporation, we unfortunately cannot put a big hat on your head and sort of do an infusion of all things good related to database. The developers who work on the eBusiness suite know the database as well as any other mere mortal walking down the street does. They make the same mistakes. I do internal training with application folks, uh, as do many of the other people I work with, trying to uh, spread the word, if you will, about how to do things. Now, even when the education process has taken place, I remember many of these these uh, applications that come in through third-party acquisitions and things like that, so they, they weren't even uh, necessarily developed in-house. Making changes to these established applications can sometimes take a very long time. And we're starting to see changes in there. You're, you're starting to see the use of constraints, for example, in most all of the applications. You won't see it in newly purchased applications, perhaps, or newly acquired applications. But over time, the use of constraints and more database features, uh, you'll see that appearing in the applications. But they're rather large ships if you will, and it takes a long time to turn these ships. They, they don't spin on the dime. But you can't necessarily look at an application and say it's a compendium of all the best practices in the world, because that application is written by people exactly like 
everybody who's listening and everybody that they work with. Uh, they're just Oracle end users. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so I think we've got time for two more questions. Uh, I'll pick two out here, which I, I hope will be useful to everybody. So the first one is from Nathan Legenda. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, he's asking, how do you recommend replicating uh, periodically a database table from one database to another when you have no control over the source database? That's a hard question because my first approach would be don't replicate in the first place. If I actually need a copy of that information, it signifies to me I really meant to have one database. So I, I would first and foremost be pushing for a consolidation. But assuming that I had to do this on a recurring basis and I wasn't allowed to alter the existing database implementation, I might, if at all possible, implement downstream streams replication, meaning we're going to process archived redo logs. So it does not, and in this processing, doesn't even have to take place on the original source base machine itself. So as the archives are generated on another box if we want to, we can post-process that, mine those logs, get the information out of it using streams or Golden Gate, and then pump that into our database. The easiest way to do it would be to put a materialized view log on the table. A very simple operation, but that will add to the workload of the production of the other system, if you will. There will be the runtime overhead of populating the materialized view. Uh, there will be the DBA management responsibilities for, for managing the materialized view log that's in place, base requirements and whatnot. And it would require a database link to be firmly established between the two databases. So sort of in order of preference, I, I would prefer to A, not replicate, but consolidate if possible. B, use a materialized view with materialized view log, depending on the amount of updates that are taking place. And if I really have to be totally hands-off, streams downstream capture would, would be a viable alternative. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> OK, so the last question we have time for is from Suman Kuma. Thank you, Suman. Uh, he's asking, do you prefer this, is, this follows on quite nicely, I think, from Nathan's questions. Do you prefer streamed replication over advanced replication in the light of trigger performance overhead since streams work on log-based changes? Yeah, I don't even need the word triggers in there. Uh, Golden Gate streams, advanced replication, and materialized views in sort of that stacked order for read-write sort of replication. Uh, I, I would not be looking at using advanced replication, especially now since uh, we have for a while been saying that advanced replication is not our focus. Golden Gate is the future direction of, of replication technologies within Oracle. So using advanced replication it's going to be supported for many, 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 many years. It's just not moving forward. It won't be uh, supporting perhaps new data types into the future and things like that. So it's, it's not that it's deprecated or de-supported. It's, it's definitely neither one of those. It's just not the stated direction going forward that, that falls into the, the Golden Gate area. And Golden Gate and streams based on redo logs, very much less resource intensive in the source database than using advanced replication or materialized views. Thank you very much, Tom. Okay, so as you mentioned, you will be able to ask questions either at asktom.oracle.com uh, or on allthingsoracle.com. Uh, we can see on the, on the screen in front of us, we've got contact details, so please contact Tom through his asktom.oracle.com website. Uh, also follow at Oracle Ask Tom on Twitter. Uh, as always, you can contact me directly by email, uh, James Mercer at Redgate.com, and also please follow what I'm doing on Twitter as well at All Things Oracle. Okay, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Tom for joining us today and for taking this session. We've got some good feedback coming in, so uh, I'm, I'm confident that everybody else enjoyed it, and I hope you did. So thank you, Tom. Okay, thank you. Goodbye.
And to everybody else, thank you as always for joining me. Uh, please look out for my email and I wish you all a good day or a good evening depending on where you are. Thank you again.